Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we are here for you, to worship you, to love you, to enjoy being in your presence with your people. We thank you for the true things that we've sung about you this morning, for the true things we've received from, received from Psalm 16 this morning. In your presence there is a fullness of joy, O oh God. And thank you for bringing us into your presence through Jesus Christ, for giving us access to you by him. And so, Father, please now, by your Holy Spirit, open up your word to us. We need you. We need you, Lord. Father, we thank you that we can gather, though just a few of us here. We thank you for those who are gathering in their homes this morning. And, Father, we do pray that by your grace we might be able to gather again as a local body of Christ under one roof to worship you and to continue in the work of furthering your gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Kenora Bible Church. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4 where we will be continuing on where uh, our brother Alan left off last week. Today our focus is going to be on verses 8 and 9 in Philippians chapter 4, where we are going to consider what the Christian is to think about and what they are to do when they've had their hearts and their minds guarded from anxiety by the peace of God. But let's pick up in verse 2 of chapter 4 and read together from there. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 2. I entreat Euodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Now, before we walk through these verses together, I want to briefly consider the occasion that brings about Paul writing this letter and also his intention. One of the things our brother Alan has brought to our attention again, as again, again and again as we've worked through this book is that Paul had a genuine love and affection for the church in Philippi. Paul says things like, I hold you in my heart, one, chapter 1, verse 7, or I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ, chapter 1, verse 8. He refers to them as my beloved. Why is it that Paul feels such a warm affection for the Philippians? Listen to what Paul writes in chapter 1, verse 3 about them. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. What motivates Paul to thank God for the Philippians every time he thinks about them and to always pray for them with joy? Well, Paul tells us what motivates him in the very next verse, verse 5. Paul says, because of your partnership in the gospel 
from the first day until now. The grounds for Paul's thanksgiving and joy and love and affection for the Philippians is that they are knit together in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have been partakers of grace together, as Paul writes in chapter 1, verse 7. And they have partnered together for the furtherance of the gospel in Macedonia and in Rome. But Paul has received some news. Paul has received news that all is not well in the church in Philippi. There are two things in particular that are threatening this partnership, which is in turn threatening the advance of the gospel. First, in chapter 3, Paul warns them of a heretical teaching on salvation that was creeping into the church. A teaching that said salvation is by faith in Christ plus the work of circumcision. And Paul knows that if the purity of the gospel message is compromised, then the message of salvation by grace through faith in Christ will cease to advance. And perhaps even worse, a false gospel message will advance in its place. So to remind the Philippians of the true gospel, Paul emphatically writes in chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, that he does not have a righteousness of his own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Secondly, there was disunity in the church body at Philippi. And this too was threatening the advance of the gospel message. In chapter 4, verse 2 to 3, we read about a disagreement between Euodia and Syntyche. Now, we're not told the exact cause of this disagreement, but we can be quite certain that they were not in disagreement about essential biblical doctrines, such as the nature of salvation, which Paul addressed head-on with them in chapter 3. But notice in chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says and reminds them that these two women, Yodia and Syntyche, had previously labored side by side with him in the gospel. And sadly, it sounds as though they are no longer laboring together because of their disagreement. So Paul is eager for a return of unity within the church body at Philippi around the pure gospel message for the advance of that message to the glory of Jesus Christ. And so we come to verses 8 and 9 within the context of a local church that is waning in their joy, is having their peace threatened by anxiety, and is losing sight of the gospel message that it should be advancing. Let's read verse 8 and 9 again together. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. The very first word we read in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 is finally. This word compels us to look closely at the preceding verses. This word finally connects what Paul is about to say with what he has just said. Literally, Paul is saying, in regards to what remains... And if we look at verses 6 and 7, something truly awesome has taken place. The Philippians' hearts and minds are being threatened by anxious feelings and thoughts, perhaps because of the disunity in the church, or the persecution they were experiencing, or their extreme poverty, which we read about in Corinthians. And yet through prayer and supplication made to God that are filled with thanksgiving, their hearts and minds become guarded against anxiety by the peace of God. A peace that is beyond human understanding. Verse 7, we read, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds 
in Christ Jesus. Notice in verse 7 that Paul draws a line from the peace of God to Christ Jesus. I believe that the peace of God that Paul has in mind here is twofold. On one hand, it's the sense of peace that Christians experience and enjoy through thankful prayer in the midst of very trying circumstances, such as being imprisoned, as Paul was as he wrote this letter. But it's also a peace which flows from the assurance of reconciliation with God that is in Christ Jesus. It is the peace of right standing with God that the Philippians possess, having gone from being his enemies to being his children, brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, transformed from spiritual deadness into spiritual life by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 5, chapter 1, we read, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If we are going to experience any measure of God's peace in exchange for our daily anxieties, that peace will have to flow from the fountainhead of Jesus Christ, who has reconciled us to God by his death and resurrection. And so I ask this morning, friends, do you know this peace with God? This is the starting point. Has God's condemnation and wrath because of your lawbreaking been absorbed by Christ or does it remain on you? Have you had your sins put on Christ and his righteousness put on you? Have you been reconciled to God? If not, then there is no amount of prayer or right thinking or right living that will bring you God's peace. Because peace with God cannot be earned by law keeping. As Paul reminded the Philippians in chapter 3, it can only be received by faith in Christ. So if you do not have this peace, repent of your sin and believe in Jesus Christ. And you will receive eternal life and God as your heavenly father. What then is the Christian to think about? And what is the Christian to do when they've had their hearts and minds guarded by the peace of God? Well, we immediately see in verses 8 and 9 that freedom from anxiety through the peace of God that happens through thankful prayer does not lead to mindlessness or inaction, but rather it leads to thinking and it leads to doing. Think about these things, Paul writes in verse 8, and practice these things in verse 9. God does not pour his peace into his children so that they will be idle or apathetic either in mind or body. The peace of God does not produce lazy Christians who disengage from life, but rather the peace of God calls and enables Christians to action. Now this completely runs against the grain of our culture, which is becoming increasingly dependent upon things which numb the mind, things which promote idleness, and we see this in some of the very things that our government has declared to be essential during this pandemic. Things such as liquor stores and marijuana dispensaries. We see this in the consumption of social media and video games and entertainment, which has ballooned during the pandemic. But the peace of God does not lead to these things. Rather, the peace of God is to be applied to right thinking and to right practice in the strength that Jesus supplies. A second observation about verse 8 
It is clear that Paul is keenly interested in the minds of the Philippians. And this is not the first time that he has addressed their minds in his letter. In chapter 1, verse 9, Paul prays that their love would abound with knowledge and discernment. In chapter 1, verse 27, he says he wants them to be standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And in chapter 2, verse 2, he asked them to complete his joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full, of co- full accord and of one mind. And in chapter 2, verse 4 to 5, he tells them to have a mind that is humble and that counts others more significant than themselves, a mind that looks to the interest of others. Remember, One of Paul's chief aims in writing this letter is the restoration of unity within the Philippian church for the sake of the spread of the gospel to the glory of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that Paul intends to bring about this oneness of mind among the Philippians is to ensure that they are thinking about the right things. I think we would all agree that when anxiety and disunity becomes a dominant theme in our lives, our thoughts tend away from what is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. And Paul's aim here is to recalibrate the thinking of the Philippians for the promotion of unity in the church and for the furtherance of the gospel. So what then are we to think about? At the start of verse 8, we see that Paul is addressing his admonition with regards to thinking to the entire church, all of the members at Philippi. He says, finally, brothers, or this could be translated, finally, brothers or sister, and sisters. So this is an admonition which Paul is applying to the whole church, the elders, the deacons, Euodia, Syntyche, and the rest of the church members in Philippi. And six times, Paul uses the word whatever to capture the subject matter that fall under each category of thought. Literally, Paul is saying, think about as many things as are true. As many things as are honorable, as many things as are just, as many things as are pure, as many things as are lovely, and as many things as are commendable. What are the Philippians and the Christians to think about when they are ruled by the peace of God? This word think at the end of verse 8 means to reckon or to consider It may be also translated as dwell. And so we see that first the Christian is to think about whatever is true. Whatever accords with reality and whatever is authentic. Literally, the word true means what can't be hidden. And it stresses the undeniable reality of something when it has been fully tested. In our minds, we are to think about and embrace what is actually true. And we have hordes of information coming at us all the time. Some of it is in fact true. Some of it is clearly untrue. And some of it, some of it we just don't know if it is true or false. For the things that we cannot affirm as true, such as overhearing gossip or slander, the half-truths that Satan whispers to us, And a lot of the news and the social media we read these days, we should not savor or dwell upon those things in our minds. We are to filter out anything which may be false or misleading and think upon the things that we know to be absolutely true. Second, Paul says, think about whatever is honorable. Paul has in mind here all things that are dignified, And that are worthy of respect and reverence. As opposed to those things which are dishonorable, shameful, or vulgar. 
The peace of God leads to a mindset that enjoys thinking about reputable and noble things. Third, whatever is just. That is to say, whatever is correct or righteous, especially in accordance with the standards of God's word. The mind that enjoys the peace of God is a mind that celebrates and loves what is just and does not treasure what is unjust. Fourth, Paul says to think about whatever is pure. The mind that is governed by the peace of God thinks about what is chaste, innocent, upright, free from defilement, holy and sacred. It does not delight in or dwell upon impure or lustful thoughts. And it does not celebrate the sins of others. Fifth, whatever is lovely, we are to give our minds to thinking about things that are beautiful and admirable. Things that are worthy of our affection and awaken pleasure that is in accordance with righteousness. A mind that is guarded by the peace of God does not give itself over to thoughts which are ugly or crude or loathsome. Sixth, whatever is commendable. That is, think about whatever is reputable or well spoken of by others. The Christian should think about things that are agreeable to all, worthy of applause, and which are pleasing to God. The last two categories of thought which Paul touches on here are even broader than the first six. And they seem to actually capture and summarize what Paul has already said. Paul says, if there's any excellence and anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Anything that is good, anything that is excellent, anything virtuous, think about that. This includes anything excellent or worthy of praise which we might see or hear in our time spent with our families or in this church with brothers and sisters, with co-workers, in the grocery store, while walking downtown and with our unbelieving neighbors. On this last point, commentator Matthew Henry writes, the apostle would have the Christian learn anything which was good of their unbelieving neighbors. We should not be ashamed to learn anything good of bad men or those who have not our advantage. And I think he's right. I think we can become tempted, can become, we can be tempted to become cynical and resentful towards the world and towards people who do not hold a Christian worldview. But Paul would have us look for and think about and praise things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise wherever we might find those things in our world. I'd like to consider two points of application from verse 8. First, the question before us is not, will you think today? The question is, what will you think about today? Have you noticed that you do not need to tell yourself to start thinking in the morning? Thinking is similar in that way to breathing. It does not take a conscious effort to make it happen. Before your feet have taken their first steps in the morning, your mind may have already put on miles. In a 1954 sermon series on spiritual depression, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones made the following statement with respect to our thought life and its connectedness to anxiety and depression. He says, and I quote, The main trouble in this whole matter of spiritual depression, in a sense, is this, that we allow ourselves to talk to ourselves instead of talking to ourselves. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness is due to the fact that you have listened to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them. 
but they start talking to you. They bring you back to the problems of yesterday. Somebody is talking. Who is talking to you? Yourself is talking to you. The main art in the matter of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself, he says. You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. You must say to your soul, why art thou downcast? What business do you have to be disquieted today? You must turn on yourself, unbraid yourself, condemn yourself, exhort yourself, and say to yourself, hope thou in God, instead of muttering in this depressed, unhappy way. And then you must go on to remind yourself of God, who God is, and what God is, and what God has done, and what God has pledged himself to do. I think Lloyd-Jones is quite right. And if we are one of our own worst enemies, then we can certainly say the same for Satan when it comes to our thoughts. He is the father of lies, after all, and Christ's supreme enemy. Satan delights in robbing our joy and filling us with anxiety. And he does this by planting half-truths in our mind or causing us to doubt God's word. And he does this because if Satan can create disunity and cause us to be anxious, he will suppress the furtherance of the gospel and the glory of Jesus Christ. He will also lessen our assurance in salvation. And his tactics have not changed. Think of Adam and Eve and the half-truth he spoke to them when he tempted them. Think of his temptation of Christ when he used God's very word out of context to tempt Christ to disobey his father. Satan is crafty, and so we must be aware of the thoughts he puts in our mind. And dealing with him, we go to the same prognosis that Jones laid before us. We must remind ourselves of God, who God is, what God has done, and what God has promised to do. And this brings us to our second point of application. We cannot underestimate the value of the Bible in right thinking. If we are to take our thoughts captive, as Paul admonished the Corinthians, and if we are to wage war because we are in a spiritual warfare in our minds, if we are to know what is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent and worthy of praise, we must start with God's authoritative word, divinely inspired by his Holy Spirit, entirely without error, completely sufficient to instruct us in all matters of salvation and life. We must go to our Bibles. Are you struggling with anxiety today? Begin as Paul has instructed us. Pour your heart out to God, telling him of your struggles. Present your request to him with thanksgiving. And then with a heart and mind that has been guarded by God's peace, the peace of the gospel of Jesus Christ, turn your attention and mind to the word of God so that your thoughts may be filled with what is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. Would you be free from anxiety? Turn your thoughts away from yourself and behold the God of the Bible. Behold his glory, his holiness, his power, his ability, his love, his trustworthiness, his faithfulness, his justice, his mercy, his forgiveness, and his grace. And behold where God's justice and wrath meet his mercy and grace at the cross of Jesus Christ. Behold the gospel, brothers and sisters, every day. Behold Jesus. If you and I neglect the gifts 
of prayer and reading our Bibles, we should not wonder why we are so anxious. Of course we're anxious. God's children cannot survive, let alone thrive, apart from daily communion with God. Let us take a hold firm of the essential, ordinary means of grace which God has given to his children. Let's pray often and soak our minds in his word. I do want to be careful on this point, however. I do not want to oversimplify the matters of anxiety and depression. And I do, want, do not want to present prayer and the Bible as a sort of silver bullet that will instantly kill all anxiety and depression. Many Christians, past and present, have been and are afflicted by periods of deep depression and debilitating anxiety. And for them to be told that they just need to pray more or read their Bibles more, although it's often very well intended, can often add to their burden. If your anxiety is the kind that goes beyond the everyday anxieties that we all experience and include feelings of despair and hopelessness, I would like to assure you on the authority of God's word that Christ will not abandon you. He will not abandon those whom he died to save. Jesus said in John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Though God's promises may feel distant, he remains faithful to his word. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not quench. Isaiah 42, 3. So your feeble prayer in the time of depression is a good prayer that God hears and answers. It is a prayer that the Holy Spirit will bring before the throne of grace. Consider the words of Samuel Rutherford written in the 1600s. He says, believe God's love and power more than you believe your own feelings and experiences. Your rock is Christ, and it is the rock, it is not the rock that ebbs and flows, it is the sea. Your rock is Christ, and it is not the rock that ebbs and flows, it is the sea. Christ is sure. Brothers and sisters, how is your thought life today? Is your mind being guarded by the peace of God? And are you dwelling on things that are indeed true and honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise? Do the things you take in to your mind, the movies you watch, the music you listen to, the books that you read, do they fit within Paul's categories of thinking and do they cultivate that sort of thinking? What are you thinking about today? Well, in the remainder of our time together, which is running out, let us look at verse 9 briefly. Paul writes, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. What are we to do then? What should the Philippian Christian do or practice? What should we do when our minds have been guarded from anxiety by God's peace? Well, according to verse 9, the Philippians are to do what Paul did and follow his teaching. They are to do what they have learned, received, heard, and seen in him. In verse 9, Paul is elaborating on what he has already told the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 17, where Paul writes, Brothers, join in imitating me. 
keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. Now, it might sound to us like Paul is boasting in what he's saying in these verses, but he's not. The things Paul has been teaching the Philippians, he's received from Christ. They are not his own ideas. Galatians 1.12 tells us that. And the life that he lives, he lives by the grace of God in faith. Galatians 2.20. And he does it in the strength that God supplies. Philippians 4.13. And so Paul can confidently say, follow me as I follow Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Notice that Paul is able to tell the Philippians with confidence to not only practice what he's preached, but to also practice what they've seen him practice. Paul's teaching and doctrine align with his lifestyle. His Christianity is genuine and sincere. I think it would probably be right for us to assume that there were some among the Philippians whom Paul would not want them to keep their eyes on or to follow their example, such as those who Paul referred to as dogs in chapter 3, those who are teaching a false gospel. Or maybe he wouldn't even want them to keep their eyes at this time on Euodia and Syntyche, at least not until they had sorted out their disagreement. Where there is disunity or disagreement in the church, there is a danger of God's people becoming confused, disoriented, and overwhelmed. Many Christians have become unnecessarily discouraged and disillusioned with the church because they've fixed their eyes on those in the church who either set aside the clear doctrines of the Bible or who do not have any resemblance to Jesus Christ in their lifestyle. One of the ways to guard against such discouragement and disillusionment is to keep as our example those who submit to the Bible's teaching and those who follow Christ's example. So what are these things that Paul's been doing in the presence of the Philippians? Let's briefly review the main things that the Philippians have learned, received, and heard from Paul. And as we review them, I encourage you to hold these things up to yourself like a mirror and examine your own life. I must examine my own life as we consider the things that Paul is teaching you and I. In chapter 1, they experience Paul's genuine love and concern for their welfare and joy in the faith. They've seen Paul's joy in suffering even, and his willingness to endure persecution for the advancement of the gospel. They've heard of Paul's single-mindedness to glorify Christ, both in his life and in his death, if it comes to that. In chapter 2, they heard of Christ's example of humility, who became obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. They've witnessed the unity and the love that exists between Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus. In chapter 3, they were reminded of the pure gospel of salvation through faith in Christ. They've seen Paul's example of forgetting what lies behind and straining for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. And in chapter 4, they've been admonished to pursue unity, to rejoice always, and to not be anxious, but rather to pray thankful prayers, think right things, and live according to the example that Paul has left them. As we come to the end of verse 9, we read that the God of peace will be with the Philippians. He will be with them if they will give themselves to right thinking and right practice. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Notice the path that Paul has been leading the Philippians down. 
The path began, began with anxiety in verse 6, which called for thankful prayer, which led to the peace of God in Christ Jesus, which led to right thinking, and which led to right practice, and which ended with being in the presence of the God of peace. Paul has inverted his earlier, earlier assurance that the peace of God in Christ Jesus would protect the praying Christian's heart from anxiety. And he points to an even greater promise that the God of peace himself will draw near to them. From the peace of God to the God of peace. What Paul is not suggesting is that God abandons Christians when they're not thinking rightly, or when they're not putting into practice the things that we see in Paul. That would go against the clear biblical teaching that the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, indwells all true believers. At the moment of conversion, all Christians receive and are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, we read, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So if it doesn't mean that God leaves us, what does it mean? What does Paul have in view when he says that the God of peace will be with you following right thinking and right practice? What Paul is speaking of is a keen awareness and an experience of the presence of God. There will be a tangible peace and an experienced fellowship with God when the Christian is thinking in accordance with Paul's teaching and is living in obedience to Christ. And conversely, that awareness of God's presence and the peace of his fellowship is lost when the Christian is not thinking as they should or is not following the example that Paul has left us. In the times when we are not experiencing an awareness of God's presence and the peace that his nearness brings, we would be wise to examine our thought life and our actions. But let us also always remember Though our sins may cause us to lose the peace of God and a sense of his presence, God will not abandon his children. His children whom he purchased with the blood of Christ. He will bring them back to repentance and he will continue the work of sanctification that he began in them until it is complete. Though Paul was writing this letter to the church nearly 2,000 years ago. It bears the same authority and relevance for us today. It seems that fear is the prevalent emotion across our entire planet these days. And anxiety threatens our peace every day. We know what it feels like to experience disunity in our families, in our friendships, and in our church. And we know how anxiety and disunity causes us to become discouraged and to lose sight of our calling to follow Christ and to advance the gospel message into Kenora and beyond. But let us trust in what we've read in the Bible today. With the peace of God and with the God of peace, let us by faith put into practice the things we've been taught about our thought life and our actions. And in faith, may we look to Christ and lean on Christ and receive the strength to accomplish these things. In order that, in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.